G'day, I'm Charles. I'm one of the pastors at Grace City Church in Waterloo, and today I'm speaking to Paul Grimmond. Uh, he's the Dean of Students at Moore Theological College. Uh, and today we're speaking about the topic of anxiety. Uh, Paul has just released a new book called When the Noise Won't Stop. Uh, and in this book, he helpfully unpacks not only a biblical framework for understanding anxiety, but shares some of his own lived experience of it. Uh, and so I'm really excited to uh, hear about not only what the Bible says, but some of his own personal wisdom in speaking into this topic of anxiety. Now, Paul, you've um, written this book, uh, but it's not something that's just kind of abstract and kind of um, removed for you. This is actually part of your lived experience. Um, could you perhaps share some of that uh, with yeah. us? Um, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? I, I want to say at the outset, I think everyone's lived experience is quite different. So this is me. Mm. Um, um, I think I was an anxious kid although I had no language for that or way of expressing that or understanding it. Yeah. Um, I know now that I had a, a series of episodes as a young teenager, which I know now are panic attacks, um, which are this kind of all of body experience, a bit like you're going mad um, and so distressing that you almost wish that you could get rid, like <laughs> exit your body and kind of leave stuff behind. Um, for me, um, I think a lot of that was attached to things around health, yeah. um, so um, mortality and uh, living and dying and those kinds of things. Um, that particularly came back to impact me, I think, in my middle 20s when I had a string of just I, searing pain in the side of my head that would only last for five or ten seconds. But after that happened, I would then have these whole body responses again that I didn't know what they were. I'd feel faint and nauseous and distressed and wonder whether there was something seriously wrong. And I would end up in casualty and they'll do a string of tests and say, no, you're all okay and go home. Um, yeah. So it took a little while <laughs> of a number of those experiences, which were all panic experiences. Um, but the worst one, um, not long before our first daughter was born, I actually end up in a full blown panic attack, which mimics a heart attack. So tightness across the chest, pain going down the arms, um, wild distress. I was in my friend's lounge room. They called the ambulance. The ambulance came, helped me to calm down. Everything was all right, etc., etc., etc. And then ended up uh, hospitalized for a little while while they checked out a whole bunch of symptoms and did a bunch of tests and again said, look, there's basically nothing that we can find physiologically wrong. Yeah. Um, and I remember going and seeing a psychiatrist actually who started to talk about this isn't, this is not something bad in your body, but there's a deep psycho and somatic, so brain and body yeah. connection that's going on for you and these things are being sparked. Yeah. Um, that's had other impacts for me when work got really stressful and busy, um, burnout became a thing for me, which I think is associated with my levels of anxiety. Anyway, there's some other picture. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, something you just said before is that everyone's experience is different. Yeah. Um, but can you perhaps just give us an idea, what actually is anxiety? Yeah, I mean, well, our body has an autonomous system, right? That's mm. designed to tell you there's something dangerous or threatening or not good in the world that you need to, to respond to, right? So um, there are parts of, there are chemical pathways and neural pathways that cause your body to react to perceived danger by getting you ready to do something. And different people respond in different ways. So there's the whole kind of um, flight, you can run away, there's the fight you can turn and, and the freeze thing. So some people that, all of those hormones, when that reaction happens, you just kind of go blank and you freeze and you kind of sit there. And all of us have probably experienced that at some mm. point in time or another. Yeah. Um, what we know is that some people's bodies are wired in a way that are much more sensitive to those reactions than others. Mm. So for people who experience this at a clinical level, that system when it gets kicked off goes into overdrive very quickly and can stay there for a very long period of time. Mm. For some people it's specific phobias, so there's one particular trigger that becomes a trigger for them that really kind of but there's an, there are other things called things like generalized anxiety disorder where this nature of their body gets triggered by all sorts of things in the world in which they live and they just it's i mean the book's called when the noise won't stop for me the the thing that captures that it feels noisy <laughs> mm. my world feels noisy and it feels a bit like i can't escape things and my thoughts are whirring and there are things that just go over and over and I can't kind of yeah. get away from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, it's interesting. So in the book, you kind of un- uh, you helpfully explain how our culture unhelpfully has separated the mind and the body, and we call this a mental health issue. But it's interesting. You're speaking a lot about the body. Yeah. Um, yeah. How much can we actually divide these things? And yeah. Look, I mean, for me, this is one of the most fascinating things about the research for the book. Actually, was just being much more deeply thoughtful about how how connected our minds and bodies are. Mm. Um, I think we come from an intellectual tradition that kind of makes us a brain that's stuck in this kind of earthly thing. And if only the brain could escape, life would be a lot better or whatever. Mm. But lots of recent neuroscience, for example, suggests that um, so much of what's going on with our brains is actually deeply connected with our bodies. Mm. Um, And there's all sorts of ways in which the research plays out. So there's this fascinating study they did with um, milkshakes. They give everybody exactly the same milkshake. They tell some people you're getting a diet milkshake and they say to other people you're getting the most decadent milkshake you've ever eaten in your life. And then they measure the level of a hormone in your body that controls how hungry you feel. The person who's told that they're eating the diet one, that doesn't change in the half an hour from when they get that information to drinking and then after they drink. The person who's told they're getting the most decadent thing ever, that hormone goes through the roof, which means their experience of hunger increases Mm. dramatically. And then after they eat, it goes (laughs) because they feel really satisfied, right? Yeah, yeah. So exactly the same number of calories are consumed, Mm. (laughs) but what your body thinks is happening with those calories is wildly different depending upon your mental state Mm. um, and vice versa. So um, your brain affects what your body does with stuff, but the state of your body is affecting your brain and how you think about life in the world. Mm. Um, And so there's this other great piece of research with the the judges. Basically, um, if you're going, they did a bunch of high court judges in Israel looking at parole cases um, and they worked out if you heard your parole case early in the day, you were really likely to get parole. If you got heard just before morning tea, you almost had zero chance of getting parole. And then after they'd eaten morning tea, your chances of getting parole went back to 60% again. So mm. these people who are supposedly like, you know, objective and uh, able to use their brains and sift the evidence and whatever were being significantly affected by mm. just the state of their bodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's all just mixed in together and it's, it's so complex. mixed in together and so complex mm. um, and so the state of your body is affecting your brain as much as the state of your brain is affecting your body mm. and your brain is not just an, a little kind of automated thinking machine like a computer mm. it's actually deeply organically connected to the rest of you yeah um, which i think is just really important to understand yeah yeah, yeah. Um, you do say something surprising in the book uh, you call anxiety a good gift from a good God. Can you explain yeah. why do you call it a good gift? Yeah. Well, I mean, at one level, what, you know, wanting to say that what people experience in extreme is what we all have. So I think God's mm. built anxiety into the created nature of the world. Mm. And partly because there are, there are moments when you really need to be anxious about things, right? <laughs> so, um, times when it's appropriate. It, that's right. Mm. Um, if there's a car hurtling at you and I'm not like, there is a moment to react and think about it afterwards. You don't yeah. to sit and contemplate all your options. Your body needs to know it's got to do something and mm. you've got to respond quickly. So there's a helpfulness in a, in a broken, messy, bitey, death-filled world for that mm. to be appropriate. Mm. But intriguingly, the New Testament actually uses the language of anxiety quite positively as well as negatively. Mm. Um, so Paul says about Timothy, he has an, a real anxiety for you, mm. which, by which he means a concern, a care, a thing where he feels and experiences a bit of what you experience. Or in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, actually, God's made every part of the body in order to have anxiety for each other. Mm. (laughs) Um, So that system is part of what alerts us to what's problematic, what matters to other people, what's helpful, what's unhelpful. So Mm. at that level, I want to say there's something precious and good and real about that. Mm. Um, But I also think um, even uh, for those of us who experience that more intensely and extremely because of the way that our bodies are wired, mm. um, that forms part of who we are, which I know, like, I mean, there are days when I just wish that I didn't experience anxiety because it's uncomfortable and miserable and awful. Mm. But I think along with that, that level of sensitivity that I experience also makes me aware of other people makes me aware of what's going on emotionally and relationally for people. Um, And I think that, you know, part of who I am as a person and the way that I relate and even the way that I love and follow Jesus 
has been impacted by my experience of anxiety in a way that's mm. taught me to depend on God, to love other people, to be aware, those kinds of things, which I think uh, there are some deep goods. In yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, something else you say is that, um, you know, anxiety, the experience of it is impacted and also tied up with sin. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you yeah. unpack that? I yeah. Mean, well, I think the most helpful language for me is like acknowledging that um, in a fallen world, um, you're going to experience suffering to some extent as a sufferer. Mm. That is, you might ha you you have a body that's been shaped in this world and it's not perfect and it's messy in the way that it responds. And you live in a fallen world and encounter sin and brokenness and all that kind of stuff. So mm. it gets triggered by those things and reacts. Mm. Um, one of the interesting things, though, I think that if you look at the world of kind of secular psychology, um, what they would want to say is that um, any sense that you have of responsibility or guilt or anything for all of those things, well, it's not you, it's just your body, and so you mm. can separate yourself from that and whatever. But I think what the Bible tells me is that somebody who has those kinds of reactions, they're also affected by me as someone who doesn't always do the right thing <laughs> and mm. is sinful and makes some poor decisions and reacts sometimes in ways that are really unhealthy and unhelpful. Mm. Um, and I actually have found that really quite empowering in a strange kind of way as a Christian. Um, I am a sufferer and so when I'm experiencing my anxiety, just realizing I can't control all of it some of it's the result of living in a broken world. I don't have to be responsible for everything. Mm. But at the same time, I'm a human being who's answerable before God for the way that I live my life. And there are elements of me as a sinful human being that do contribute to my experience of anxiety. Mm. You know, so for me, particularly like um, avoiding conflict and pleasing people, um, uh, sometimes that, that exhibits and interacts in ways that mean that I don't do things that would be healthy and helpful for me to do in relationship. Mm. And although it might create more anxiety in the short term, it might bring better relationships and clearer, more honest relationships in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't want to completely absolve myself of responsibility, nor say, there's no, uh, you know, this is not, nothing to do with sin. This is just this is a broken world. No, I, I'm a human. I'm responsible. Mm. And by God's grace and by the power of his spirit, I can make different choices and change the way that I respond and act um, in really helpful, healthy ways, I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's, it's something, it's all mixed together as, as something that happens to us, but something that we're involved in that, you know, we're kind of in there. Um, and yeah. Yeah. As um, you actually start the book with kind of a number of just um, kind of stories of people who've, yeah. Christians um, who've struggled with anxiety. Um, as I read those, um, I noticed the language of guilt. Um, it came up a number of times. Yes. Um, you know, there's guilt over feeling like being a burden, um, you know, and guilt over, you know, am I not trusting God? Um, what would you say to somebody who feels guilty? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's a, it's a really, it's such an important question, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think at one level partly just you know those the, the famous verses so philippians 4 do not be anxious about anything um, there can be a sense as christians that just being anxious is a result of our sin and our sinfulness yeah. um, and part of saying the bible uses the word positively as well as negatively is to remind you it's not it's not as straightforward and as simple as that yeah. um, but i think at a deeper level um, it's interesting what when I talk with people who struggle with anxiety and I do feel a deep guilt about the way that it impacts their ability to serve God and to serve other people and all that kind of stuff, um, a lot of times I think they take on themselves responsibility or a weight for things that they're not actually in control of mm. uh, and can't manage and do. Um, but I think I want to say even more fundamentally than that, if I was to describe the best thing uh, about the gospel, about the fact that Jesus has died and completely cleanses me from my sin. I think the Bible says that I no longer stand, like if I had to characterize my relationship with God in heaven, it's that he is my father and I am his son and he loves me no matter what. <laughs> and so I, um, my life is not designed to, 
<laughs> um, it's not like I'm looking for any sign of guilt and then out of guilt trying desperately to do something about that to fix up my relationship with God. That's simply not the way that relationship with God as my Heavenly Father works. Mm. You know, He loves me. He has given Jesus to completely remove all of the guilt. Of like, and I just, it's staggering, right? Everything that I've ever done that offended mm. Him and hurt other people uh, everything that I will do in the future that might offend him, hurt other people. Um, God has in Christ done what is necessary, everything that's necessary to count me clean mm -hmm. and to say that I am his child. And so um, guilt is not the fundamental starting point or even in, like, do you know what I mean? It's not mm -hmm. the space of my relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... Um, it's one thing to say that it's a very different thing for people who are struggling to appropriate that. But I think to stop and think very deeply about what God's saying to you in the death of Jesus mm. um, helps you to remember um, you're not in this dangerous place of suddenly offending God, losing your relationship, being found on the outside, and etc., etc., etc. And that lots of what people experience guilt about, which is not loving enough, not serving others enough, etc., etc., etc. Lots of those are actually just, they are realities about being human and finite and limited. <laughs> yeah. They're not about being sinful and rebellious and, and broken. Yeah. Um, so just keep preaching the gospel to yourself and reminding yourself that you, God loves you and you're in a place of security. Yeah. And when you experience your anxiety, God treats you tenderly in that space um, rather than as an angry father. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the gospel, it's, it says such wonderful things uh, to all of us in all of our experiences. Yeah. And there's, there's hope and good news here for people who struggle with this particular thing. Absol like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, something I've kind of heard around is that we should leave kind of issues of mental health, anxiety to the professionals. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that's like reflective of a kind of a division between faith and kind of medicine. Um, yeah, how much do you think we can separate those things? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? In some ways for me, it comes back to that mind-body stuff that we talked about mm. before as well. Um, and I think um, what I want to say is that it's possible to, um, the medical world operates on a scientific paradigm, which I think grows out of a Christian worldview, but can end up denying it. Mm. So the, at one level, science just says you live in a world that's kind of regular and repeatable and you can watch what happens and you can learn some stuff from that and you can learn how to do better things with that. Right? Mm. Um, unfortunately, hum, sinful human beings take that and go, actually, well, I can explain the whole world without reference to God. And actually this here, this stuff about how the world works denies God's existence and all of that other stuff. I want to say, well, at that point, that's very unhealthy and unhelpful. Mm. Um, but the, the fundamental place that they've begun from, which is we live in a world that's regular and repeatable because there's a kind God whose character and nature is like that. And so we can actually learn from the nature of the created order. There's actually good and real and right. So I want to say that it, within the medical paradigm, if I can put it like that, there's actually useful information, which is just information about how the world works. Mm. that's helpful for us to appropriate. Sometimes people overlay that with stories about what that means, about God, about humanity, about relationships that gets into spaces that I think are really unhelpful and don't reflect reality. Mm. Um, I think what that means for Christians is that we have to acknowledge like what this anxiety thing is. It's partly about um, hormonal and neurological pathways and things that go on in your body that react in certain ways to the world. And for some of us, we have more of some chemicals than others, and that makes us highly reactive and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's okay, I think, to say that there, we may find some medications and things that might control that a little bit better and whatever. But look, for 98%, 99% of people with anxiety, just the medication piece is not the only thing that we need to work on. We actually need to think about what do we believe how do those beliefs affect the way that I respond to the world? Are there things that I need to change and repent of? 
Are there great things about who God is and his kindness and the nature of the world that I need to know and grab hold of and love? Because that'll help me to live more wisely and faithfully as a follower of God in the world. Mm. Um, And so I think actually working out how to integrate some of what we learn about the physical world from scientific enterprise, but with a deeper and richer and kind of wiser understanding of a world that's made by God. Mm. Um, And I think those two things can be held together Mm. in lots of ways. Mm. Yeah. So we don't want to say that just pills can fix it. No. And we don't want to say just prayers can fix it. Absolutely. I think that's exactly right. Mm. Yeah. Um, something you said actually at the start was that when you were experiencing kind of really acute anxieties, that the only thing you wanted was for God to take it away. Yeah. Um, why doesn't God just take it away? Oh. <laughs> at one level, I want to say that's an imp- it feels a bit like that's a question that's almost beyond us to answer. Mm. Um, I think what I can get is little glimpses into the reality, right? So um, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane facing the cross, he actually cries out and he says, um, Father, just please take this hour from me but not what I will, what you will. And somehow or another, in the course of God dealing well with his world and dealing with sin, it wasn't appropriate just to overlook or ignore or pretend that sin hadn't happened. There actually needed to be atonement. There needed to be uh, genuine things that were done that dealt with guilt so that God could actually declare us right before him while still acknowledging and punishing the seriousness and significance of sin. And all of that is real and needed to happen. And that meant that Jesus, rather than just kind of skating above it all, came and waved his magic wand and fixed it up, he actually became part of us. He shared our humanity. He took our sins with him to the cross and died on our behalf. Mm. Okay, so I I think there's that kind of picture that's there. Look, and I think the the other thing that's going on there in terms of um, longing for God to take it away, when you get to the end of the book of 2 Corinthians, The Apostle Paul talks about having seen visions of the heaven reality. He's been taken up into the heavens and shown all the riches and wonder of the future creation. But after that moment, he's back here in reality. And he says, because of the surpassing excellence of that vision, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. (laughs) We don't know what that was. It, It probably some sort of illness or physical thing or whatever it was. But Paul says, I pleaded with God to take it away. Three times I pleaded with him to take it away. But what he said to me was, my grace is sufficient for you. Um, And I think, like, just as I've contemplated that, um, Paul was longing at one level for God to take this uncomfortable thing away from him. But actually what he came to understand by the grace of God was that the ongoing presence of this discomfort and the need to depend and rely on God in the midst of all of that was actually going to be better for him than simply the removing of discomfort. Mm. Um, and I think like when I watch Jesus go to the cross and be willing to go through that on our behalf, and the scriptures say that to become mature, I need to suffer and become like him in his death. And when I see Paul wrestle with that stuff, although I can't explain all the pieces, and there's, I think there's a mystery at one level, another level i just want to say that there is something about suffering that at a deep level shapes us and forms us Mm -hmm. and makes us like christ and helps us to cling to god which is so much better for us than the alternative option Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not suffering isn't something antithetical to the gospel absolutely yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. what would you say to somebody who is right in the midst of this yeah maybe even now Um, what do they need to hear? Yeah. Well, I mean, most of all, I just want to say you're a child of God if you know Jesus. Um, And I, I mean, there is something about pain and suffering that in its extreme form narrows your vision and all you want is desperately to escape this thing. Um, I want to say to you um, that In the midst of all of that, I just want you to know that you are a child of God and dearly loved. 
and lots of the guilt and things that go with that, God's already dealt with it. He's washed it clean. You're safe and it's okay. I think the second thing that I would want to say is that, you know, that desire to escape from that pain, that often leads to some behaviours that are actually, while they alleviate the pain in the short term, are really unhealthy in the long term. And whether for you, I mean, um, sexual stuff, pornography, whether it's alcohol, whether it's some form of prescription medication, or even behaviourally, whether it's things like eating or shopping or other things, um, there are ways of trying to detour away, escape the pain um, that can become deeply held habits that are not good for you. And if you know that that's happening, just find someone that you trust and ask for their help because you're probably going to need the benefit of community and the encouragement of others to wrestle your way through there and you're going to need God's help to wrestle your way out of there. Know you're dearly loved. Know that this is not the end and there is genuinely escape and change that's possible in the midst of all of these mm. things. And know above all else um, that there is a day coming when God will take it away. Um, and so that picture in the scriptures of the nature of heaven and of the reality of the sin and brokenness of the world being taken away and experiencing the joy of relationship with him and with brothers and sisters. I know that this is not my eternity. Mm. And I think that's really important. Mm. Yeah. And what would you say to somebody who is supporting um, a friend, a partner, family member yeah. who is struggling yeah. with this? Yeah. What, what do they need to hear? Oh, look, I think I would say most of all, um, um, if, you, if you think about you being in that context, what do you need? Um, you don't need everyone to be a medical professional. You don't need everyone to fix it for you either. <laughs> like, mm. um, so one of the dangers for the person moving on is that, I mean, you love them and you watch the pain and you so desperately want to fix it. <laughs> um, you can't. So get comfortable with the fact that you can't fix it. What you can do is walk gently and kindly and graciously with your hand around their shoulder beside them into the future. And what that looks like is sometimes asking them how they're doing and praying for that and sitting with them in the grief. At other days, it's just being a friend and watching television or going for a walk in the sunshine mm. or doing just the stuff of being human and life so that they know. And, and I would say, beware of letting your whole relationship with that person get trapped into the space where this becomes everything that you talk about and be mm. with each other. Actually, that's not good for anybody. It's not good for you and it's not good for them. Um, so working out how to um, share Christian truth in a way that encourages them and reminds them without blaming them or forcing them. Um, I think that helps them to point their eyes towards Jesus, um, but in a gentle way um, that walks alongside them, alongside them and is just a friend in the stuff of life um, and praying for God in his good time to help them have the resources that they need and the faith that they need to wrestle with this thing um, and see growth and change. Mm. Yeah. Paul, thank you so much uh, for sharing your um, insights into the Bible and what it says to us, but thank you as well for sharing your personal experience and your wisdom. Um, yeah, we thank God for you, uh, and I'm confident that this book will be um, of great help to many people. Brother, thanks so much for having me. It's been a real joy.